Hello everybody, my name is Novi and welcome back to the channel. As many of you probably know, tomorrow is AEW Double or Nothing Day. And while you may think it's their most celebrated day of the week because it's pay-per-view day, you'd be wrong. It's actually today, because today marks the five-year anniversary of the first ever Double or Nothing. Or in other terms, their five-year anniversary as a promotion. Given the special occasion, I thought what better time than now than to take a look at the original AW roster members back in 2019. We'll talk about their careers in the five years after that show and grade it on the usual A plus to F scale. We'll jump into all of that in just one second, but first, subscribe to the channel for live streams every Wednesday before Dynamite and new videos just like these, always doing one thing, talking grabs. What better way to start than with AEW's ultimate babyface, Hangman Adam Page. At the time of the first Double or Nothing show, it might have been a little crazy to think that he'd ever get to the level he's gotten to in AEW. He was always a guy with talent and potential, but usually slotted into the background role when it comes to groups he was a part of. It was kind of assumed that he'd end up in that same place when he teamed up with the Elite in AEW too but he broke that mold. It was through his unbreakable connection with the AEW audience as the anxious millennial cowboy that everybody wanted to see overcome his demons, that he would rise to the top of AEW, winning the world championship in the culmination of, still for my money, the best story AEW has ever told. Before that too, I don't wanna forget about his tag title run with Kenny in 2020 because that run was just as special. When you have those accolades and you have the match catalog that Hangman does, which, it should be mentioned because it's incredible. Along with being the spirit of the entire promotion, now and especially a few years ago, you're easily gonna get that A plus grade. Aja Kong is a legendary Japanese women's wrestler, widely regarded as one of the best to ever do it. Unfortunately, her run with AEW was very lackluster, especially given what I just said. She only wrestled in three matches for the promotion, most notably the six woman tag on the original Double or Nothing. And while I get she was pretty physically beaten up at this point, that doesn't really excuse the resume. And unfortunately, I have to drop the F grade. Allie, otherwise known as The Bunny, was in AEW until late last year, where she quietly exited the company. It was a fitting, unceremonious end to a pretty whatever run, if I'm being honest. She lost a lot of matches, only got maybe a couple of big opportunities, and never really got any push, thus never really gained any momentum. Her one notable match was actually pretty fantastic. It was the Street Fight versus Ty Mello and Anna J. But other than that, there's almost nothing to look back on other than her just being a solid hand in the division. So I think it has to be a C minus for Ali or the bunny. And Helico is kind of in the same boat as Ali, except he wrestled a lot more. His run, similar to the bunnies, wasn't bad necessarily, but it just included nothing really notable except for his entrance stance, which is pretty vibey. He's always just been a solid piece, whether that's in tag or in singles. So I'm just going to give him the same grade as the bunny. C minus. Awesome Kong's only contribution in AEW was being a part of the Nightmare Collective a spooky cult faction led by Brandy Rhodes. I think that tells you all you need to know. F. Look, I know we've gotten so many of these already, but B Priestley's run in AEW was pretty whatever too. She had a couple of matches, was fine in all of them, got trapped in Japan because of COVID, and is now chilling in NXT. If you go to her cage match, AEW just kind of seems like a home indie that she goes to in between stardom shows which does explain the D minus I have to give her. I'm not sure what fans, or even Billy Gunn for that matter, expected from his AEW run when he signed, but him being daddy ass probably wasn't it. That's of course his most notable period in AEW with him still being a part of the group and helping them get really over when, you know, they were trying to come up as a trio. The act itself has actually been a problem though because most fans, including myself, are just kind of ready to see it go. It's run its course in AEW. Even so, at their highest point as a trio, they had entire arenas scissoring, and that's no small part due to Billy Gunn. Even if now, I think it is time for him to leave his boots in the ring, which is pretty mean, but hey, we gotta be honest here. I think he still had some great moments in the run, and it's been something that people will talk about for a long time, so it's gonna be a C from me. Like I mentioned earlier when talking about Awesome Kong, the Nightmare Collective stunk. So for that, Brandy Rhodes gets a pretty easy F. Also, you can't forget that it's open mic night, bitch. Brandon Cutler is most well known for his role behind the camera for the Young Bucks, both on screen and on being the elite. In the beginning, he did try his hand at wrestling doing this D&D gimmick thing. And you know, he did have a feud with Peter Avalon where they were both trying to get their first win, which you know, was fun for the time. But he's been a lot better behind the camera. He serves his purpose, he does his job well. I think that's about the best you can ask for, so 
I'm going to go with a C- minus for Brandon Cutler. Next up, we have someone that we can truly dive into, the first contracted wrestler for AEW, Britt Baker. Her time in AEW is a mixed bag, depending on what you're looking for in a wrestler. If you prefer to look at in-ring stuff, Britt Baker is not the person for you. She's never really been that great, but she's also not really progressed that much. She's always lacked that speed and that snap to really push her to that next level between the ropes. It's not been all bad in the ring because even with the limitations, she did have that amazing lights out match with Thunder Rosa, which looking back is still incredible. If you're looking for more character driven stuff, Britt Baker is the wrestler for you because that's exactly where she shines. Her more recent stuff isn't the best example of this, but her time as a role model back in 2021 is. It was through that that she got her most over, with her segments giving tips on how to be a role model, being genuinely funny and unique. The crowd support she gained from that led to her eventual world title win in 2021 as well. That run has gotten mixed reviews, but in my opinion, I think it's something positive we can look back on. While it did get a little mixy towards the end, I think overall, it was good TV for the most part. But like I said in the beginning, if you're more focused on in-ring work, that run wasn't going to be for you and you're not going to grade her as high as I'm going to grade her. Because for Britt Baker, I'm going with an A-. She made herself a real star in that division and for the company as a whole when they really needed just one so I think for that, she earns the grade. Chris Jericho has done some of the best things for AEW while also doing some of the worst. When AEW was first getting started, his name being attached did help them get their TV deal. He was the first AEW world champion, establishing the belt as a top prize in wrestling through great TV and great matches, honestly. He's had some of the most memorably good feuds in AEW with the likes of Moxley, MJF, Kenny Omega, Kingston, and Orange Cassidy. But that's also a department where Chris Jericho has had a lot of bad in because that feud with Adam Cole, Sammy Guevara, even a lot of the Eddie Kingston feud was just pure dog shit. Looking more recently even, Chris Jericho has really fallen off in pretty much every aspect of his game in the last few years. He's older now, so the in-ring work isn't there. He's a guy who's known as the master of reinvention, but he hasn't been able to do that in the last few years, like I said, and he feels dry and stale as a character. And worst of all, he just doesn't know when to take a break and constantly forces his way on TV for the worst. It's gotten so bad where I think that 2023-24 Jericho is probably one of the worst TV acts I've ever seen. It gets really tough when you try to put a grade on this whole run because there's been a lot of good, but a whole hell of a lot of bad along with it. I think the most comfortable answer I'm going to go with is probably a B. I don't want to go too high, but you know, I don't want to go too low either. So again, we're going to play it safe. We're going to go with a non-threatening letter for Jericho with a B. Christopher Daniels hasn't really been a major player in the ring for AEW, but he's been a major player backstage serving as the talent relations. I think he's the head of talent relations since AEW's inception. Backstage is backstage though. We're more focused on what happens on the TV and throughout his run on TV, he's basically been a depth piece who works up and down the card and has, you know, solid matches. He's a solid pro. So for that, he gets a C. For pretty much all of Chuck Taylor's AEW career, he's been in a tag team with Trent Beretta as the best friends, and that's the perfect role for him. It's not like he stood out to any major degree, but he's done his job and he's done it well, and that's exactly what he's always needed to do. The brightest shining moment of his AEW career was almost certainly the parking lot brawls, especially the one against Santana and Ortiz that is a true AEW classic. Unfortunately, him and Trent never got the tag title run that so many people, including myself, thought they deserved, but that doesn't mean they haven't been a great team in AEW, and that doesn't mean Chucky e. T hasn't been great himself. So I think for Chuck, C+. Sema is a name I think many people will forget when talking about AEW in 2019, including myself even. He didn't wrestle too many matches, but he did manage to get a 4.5 star with Kenny in there, so props to him for that. I will say though, I think a lot of people do remember Stronghearts because I think a lot of people wanted to see more of them in AEW, and it is unfortunate that we didn't get to see it. But really, I mean, I know it's Kenny Omega, but he had a great one with him, he made the most of his time while he was in the company, and that's about the best you can ask for, so I'm gonna go with a D, just because, you know, it was a short time. Another big name is up next in Cody, who has of course had a very interesting run in AEW. He was one of the guys who of course started the promotion, and he was a huge get when they started off. And for a while there, many fans saw and loved him on the same level as Kenny Omega and the Bucks because 
he just had that attachment to them. But over time, things like the Cody verse and him not being able to challenge for the world title again, which is the most self-inflicted wound he could have, you know, got himself with, kind of eroded that love. His reluctance to turn heel is probably the worst of them all though, because fans wanted to get behind him as a heel. They wanted to boo him, but like in a kind way and like a just accepting way. But he just never let them do it. And I think that just turned into so much ill will from so many people in the fan base. Of course, he has some true classics in there, especially his match with Dustin that is probably an all timer for blood. But nowadays, when you look back at all that he's done, you think about the Cody verse and you just grimace because it was really bad. I'm not saying it was all bad though, and the classics are the classics, so I think the best I can do for Cody is probably a B plus. When I think about wrestlers who represent AEW and what it's all about, one of the first names that come to mind is Darby Allen. Darby is a very unique one-of-one -one wrestler that stands out even amongst the best of them in AEW. Sure, we all know he takes insane bumps on the regular, and those rule in their own right, but he's so much more than that as a wrestler. Wrestling from underneath, I don't think there's anyone better, and if you want someone to do a heated comeback spot, Darby is your guy. These two things, as well as his willingness to take insane bumps of course, make his match catalog as good as anyone else in AEW, truly. Like I said, Darby is one of one, and I think it's through that that he's able to connect with the fans on a level nobody else in AEW can. He does have a little bit of that Jeff Hardy in him, where kids love him, they wear his face paint, and I think there's a lot of merit to that. I don't think I can give Darby any other score than an A. He's been excellent in AEW and will always be remembered as one of the best they've ever had. Dustin Rhodes' AEW career has sneakily been really solid, especially when you consider his age. He's a vet of this game and he wrestles like one too, which I think has helped him stand out in those one-off title shots that he's been given, compared to others in a similar standing to him that have been given the same opportunities. I mentioned it earlier, but he has that match with Cody that's incredible, but Dustin has a really, really solid match catalog with a bunch of different opponents from Sammy Guevara to CM Punk Punk, and I think when he eventually calls it a day, this AW run will be looked on pretty fondly. So for that, I'm going to go with a B-. Emi Sakura is a very underrated talent in the AEW women's division and always delivers whenever she's given opportunities. There were a pair of times in 2023 where she got about a month each to wrestle on AEW's three main shows and she killed those chances if I remember correctly. I said it earlier, but Emi Sakura is an underrated and honestly underutilized talent who I hope gets used more in the next year or so and hopefully gets that all-in moment because she's been campaigning for it, it just give it to her. But for her run with AEW over the last five years, I'm going with a C. Eva Luno's time in AEW has pretty much all been spent as the head of the Dark Order. And in that role, I think he's done pretty well. I mean, he's a fine talker and all. But in the ring, it hasn't really been anything of note, except for that one time where he wrestled Jon Moxley and bled everywhere. That ruled. But other than that, he's been a solid tag trios guy and, you know, I'm not going to knock him too hard. He's He's been fine. C minus. Frankie Kazarian is one half of the first ever AW World Tag Team Champions, but he's most remembered for being the Elite Hunter, which is the funniest shit ever. He never really hunted anyone in the Elite and kind of never did anything in the role, but looking back, I, I just can't believe they did that to him, honestly. But I mean, it, it could be better than whatever he's doing in TNA right now, but looking back at his AW run specifically, there's not anything I'm gonna reminisce about, so for me, it's a D plus. We're back to people who've had great AEW runs, Hikaru Shida. Three-time AEW Women's World Champion, a litany of great matches, especially the one against Jamie Hayter, which was fantastic, and a run that's seen her featured as a staple of AEW on TV, given all these great opportunities, and she's really earned the goodwill that she's built up. For the three-time champ, I don't think there's any grade I could go with other than an A. Her run has been very, very good. From that win against the Young Bucks in the inaugural tag team title tournament, you knew to take notice of Isaiah Cassidy and Private Party. Injuries have kind of prevented them from moving up together as a team, but you can't deny Isaiah's consistent development over the last five years. He's only 26 and he shows a lot of traits, especially charisma, that makes me think he still has a bright future ahead of him. But going back to what I said earlier, Private Party hasn't been able to move up as a team because his tag team partner, Quinn, got injured. But in that time, Isaiah started working with the Hardys. Sure, it wasn't the most creatively satisfying run to say the least, 
but it can't be denied that they helped him really progress as a wrestler. Nowadays, we see him work a lot smarter, with a lot more awareness, and just in-ring knowledge as a whole. Five years later, we're still saying a lot of similar things about Isaiah that we did before. That there's a ton of potential there, but I think now, more than ever before, there's more of a chance for him to tap into it, so I hope he does soon. But for his run, C+. There's not much that I could say about Jack Evans, if I'm being honest. He was part of an aggressively fine team with Angelico in the early days of AEW, but other than that, he did really absolutely nothing. Nowadays, I think he's basically retired or at least stuck to mid-card on the indies, but hey, we're focusing on his AEW run and it's gonna be a D-. minus. When it comes to Jimmy Havoc, I think this is all that needs to be said. Let's just move on. Joey Janela's run in AEW can best be remembered by his matches with Jon Moxley and Kenny Omega, which are matches I think he lived on until the very end. He's always just been a fine wrestler, and nowadays he's a GCW guy through and through, which suits him well if you know what I mean, so it's gonna be a D. Moving on to a much brighter run in AEW, the ace of the world, or more so the ace of AEW, John Moxley. In this video, there's just so many people to get through that there's not time to talk about everybody in the depth that I'd like. That's no more true than what I'm talking about John Moxley, whose AEW career deserves a 20 minute video on its own. If there's one thing that I want to say about him though, it's that he's always been there for AEW. In true Ace fashion, he's carried them through rough time after rough time, always giving them that spark of life when they needed it the most. Truly, he is everything about AEW that makes it great, and without him, I have no idea where they'd be. Moxley's career in AEW probably stands right there at the very top, and of course, that deserves an A+. The thing about Jungle Boy Jack Perry that people don't think about when they think about his AEW run is just how many gems he has in his match catalog. You wouldn't expect it because like I said, nobody talks about it, but he has bangers with so many people in the main event scene. Not to mention his tag matches with Luchasaurus as the Jurassic Express being great on their own. It's an easy thing to forget when talking about all the pillars, but especially with Jack, he's really early into his wrestling career. And I think given all that we've seen, there's no way I couldn't think that he has all the potential in the world. Which is funny because of just how many great matches he already has. His mic work was really the only major weakness for him for a long time there. But now, after he's become the scapegoat, he's shown a ton of improvement, being damn near a promo guy at this point. Jungle Boy Jack Perry has had a truly underrated AEW run, and one that I think is only gonna get better. A. Remember how I said Moxley's AEW run would require a 20 minute video to fully get into it? Well, with Kenny Omega, we might need that same thing, maybe double. I know that I've said countless great matches so many times throughout this video, and spoiler, I'm gonna continue saying it, but that's no more true than when talking about Kenny Omega. Then when we're talking about championship reigns, I don't think there's one better in all of AEW than Kenny's world title reign. It's like with Mox, I wish I could go into more detail when talking about Kenny's run because there's just so much greatness that I could tap into, but I'll leave it at this. He's truly been everything AEW needed him to be, and more. Hopefully he's back in the ring sooner rather than later, because I can't take not seeing him on AEW TV much longer. There's only four people on this list who are getting an A-plus grade, and Kenny Omega is of course one of them. Kip Sabian is a guy who's truly just been there throughout his AEW run. There was that best man stuff with Miro, which gave us Arcade Anarchy, which is a great match. And then there was that underrated over it bag he used to wear on his head when he came back from injury, which kind of exemplifies the point I'm making. He was just there. It's honestly the only way I can describe his run, just there. So for that, it's gonna be a D plus. Kylie Ray is someone who never really had an AEW run. After her debut match on the original Double or Nothing, she requested her release, it was granted, and that was that. Later, she would say that her request was due to her own mental health struggles, which no matter how you put it sucks, and I hope she's doing better now. Since she only had one match in AEW, I don't really think I can give a grade to the run, I just hope she's doing well these days. Leva Bates was a librarian on screen and did a bunch of stuff backstage. I, you know, F, I don't, I don't know what to say. Luchasaurus is someone that people thought would only ever be in a tag team in AEW. However, after Jack Perry became Jack Perry, 
he went on a singles run that I don't think anyone could have expected. As funny as this is, he won a singles title before Jack Perry, winning the TNT belt on the first ever episode of Collision. That run really wouldn't be much of anything for Luchasaurus, it was really more of a story base to the point where he barely even held the belt when he had it. Looking back, I think Luchasaurus, or Kill Switch, will be remembered as someone who had a very funny TNT title reign, and also just a big man that nobody really had any problems with. That is, aside from me, when he wrestled Brock Anderson in a match I was in the building for. And I'm not gonna dock him for that, but you know, we, we have a little bit of beef there. But his run as a whole, I'm giving a C plus. The only thing Marco Stunt did in AEW was stand beside Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus as part of the Jurassic Express. He had a few matches, but whatever, he was fine in that role and I'm just going to give him a D minus. Mark Quinn is the other half of Private Party, whose injuries kind of derailed a promising career. He was out from late 2022 to early this year, and it honestly staggered his development because it was such a key time for him. I mentioned it earlier, but he is at risk of getting outshined by Isaiah just because of that time lost, and I do hope that he can get back to the point where he was and just get on a steady path of growth, if I'm being honest. At the end of the day, he's a solid tag wrestler who I hope we see more of this year beside Isaiah Cassidy because as a team, they just work really well together. For Mark Quinn's own individual AW run though, I don't think I can give any higher than a C-, minus, kind of given everything. There's something really funny I noticed while scrolling cage match doing research for this big list. If a given wrestler has been in a tag team, and that given tag team has ever wrestled the Young Bucks, it's likely that they have a four and a quarter star match on their hands. It's a testament to just how consistently great the Young Bucks have been over the last five years. At no point were they better though than their 300 day tag title run throughout 2022 through 2021. They produced some incredible TV, had even better matches, and most of all, made those belts feel like the most important thing in AEW somehow. The funny thing is, they did the exact same thing for the trios belts when they had that best of seven series against the Death Triangle. Those will probably be remembered as some of the best trios matches in AEW history, somehow all being good despite the fact that there were seven in a row. The Bucks, just like Mox, Omega, and Hangman, are what make AEW what it is. Yes, of course, because they helped start the whole thing, but also just because they're fantastic at what they do. And now, they're looking to continue that legacy as the EVPs, which, to put it bluntly, is already the best shit ever. For everything that they've done in AEW, and what they'll continue to do in their third tag title run, Young Bucks are an easy A+. For this list, I only include guys who've had matches for AEW, which still has its own flaws because Michael Nakazawa has wrestled matches for them. Of course, he's not really a wrestler in AEW, he's Kenny Omega's guy, and for that, I'm not gonna give him a rating. Uh, if I had to, just say Kenny Omega's guy. There's not a young guy in pro wrestling who has it in the same way MJF has it. As a dastardly, irredeemable, douchebag heel, he was at the center of AEW more often than not. His feuds, which are still some of the best AEW has ever had, are the best example of this. Just remember back to MJF versus Jericho, versus Cody, versus Mox, versus Punk. I mean, those are all genuinely incredible. And if we just took those into account, he'd be getting that A plus grade alongside Omega, Mox, The Bucks, and Hangman. Unfortunately, we can't though. We have to take it all into account. And what keeps him from the top is his AEW World Championship run. Sure, he had some great matches as a champ, especially against Kenny Omega, Brian Danielson, and Samoa Joe, but the content of the reign genuinely got horrific towards the end there. I agree with a lot of the criticism, but what I do want people to remember whenever I talk about that run is that MJF was only 28 years old, and it was his first world title run. In all likelihood, I think he learns from it, gets a lot better, and hopefully has an even better run ahead of him because he has a long career ahead of him. At least I hope he does, because given his talent, I think he has the potential to be the best to ever do it, honestly. Put him up against anyone else his age, and he stands levels and levels above them. I can't put him directly at the top. I can't excuse that world title run. But I think in time, I will be because at his best, MJF is one of the best. He's been a part of some of the best stuff AEW has ever done, and I think that for sure 
earns him an A grade. Nyla Rose is the epitome of solid, and that's long been a great thing for the AEW women's division. She's never really stood out as a worker, but she always does her job well and makes whoever she's going against look great. It's why I think they chose her to wrestle Riho in the first ever AEW Dynamite to crown the first ever world champion, because they knew what she was going to give them. She was going to make Riho look incredible, and that she did, and while she would lose that match, she would go on to win the world championship down the line. And although her reign was underwhelming to say the least in terms of content, it's deeper than that because she became the first ever transgender wrestler to win a world title in a major American company. Of course, she broke the original barrier when she became the first transgender wrestler to sign to a major American promotion, but that doesn't make the accomplishment any less valuable. Nyla is a great hand for any division to have, and I think throughout these last five years, she's proved to be very, very solid and I think that earns her a B- for me. Orange Cassidy is assigning so many freaks hated online when it was announced, but he's proved to be one of their best. In the early days, he was more of a novelty, appearing in random places, doing his lazy work in the ring, and even then, a connection with the audience was there. Over time, that bond only got stronger, with him getting some of the loudest reactions in the entire company pretty quickly. He's also given AEW a shit ton of YouTube views, being in five of their 10 most popular videos on their channel. It's not a stat that I really take into account, but I think it just exemplifies just how popular he is. He's always been loved by fans, and that's why everybody was so happy to see him win his first major singles title when he won the international championship. Towards the end, it did go too long and it did fall off pretty hard, but it culminated in a match versus Jon Moxley in the main event of All Out 2023. Him main eventing a pay-per-view is a big moment within itself. It kind of exemplifies just how far he's come, but the match itself was really, really great, and it saw Orange Cassidy bleeding all over the ring, all over the outside. He was gushing everywhere. He would go on to lose that match and his belt, and after the bell, he lays flat on his back in the center of the ring, clearly dejected. But then suddenly, you start hearing his signature freshly squeezed chant, that then builds into a thank you orange chant from every person in that arena. It's a moment that he earned through years and years of building that connection with the audience. A connection that will most likely be the legacy he leaves in AEW forever, which is beautiful in its own special unique way. A. Funnily enough, we have Orange Cassidy's first major feud in AEW up next, Pac. Pac is someone who's always been great for AEW, that is, when he's around. Sadly, he loves his home country and never stays in the United States for too long, leaving fans with a sense of yearning for their favorite bastard. But, I mean, good god, when he is here, he's producing some great TV and having even better matches. His match catalog is filled with bangers, but at the same time, it does kind of feel empty. I get that doesn't really make much sense, but He's been around for five years. I feel like we should have gotten so much more greatness from him. It's not some huge knock on the grade or anything like that, but it is something to consider. I mean, he's not around all the time, and I think if he was, he'd be up there with some of the best in AEW. Something else I want to mention too, is that he was the first ever international champion, then known as the All-Atlantic Championship, which is something that he truly deserved, and a moment that I'm glad he got. At the end of the day though, Pac has had a great run in AEW, trips to England be damn, and I think he's earned an A for me. I know it's been a while since we've talked about her in this video, but the Bunnies tag team partner Penelope Ford has had a very similar run to her. She's had some decent matches here and there, but has never really been given anything substantial to run with. I think there were plenty of points in the last five years where you could have said Penelope could have gotten better and could have taken that next step, but it doesn't really seem like that's the case. In 2022, she only wrestled 12 matches, and in 2023, she only wrestled one. It seems like there's a good chance that her time with AEW is coming to a close sooner rather than later, and with nothing truly substantial to look back on, aside from that street fight of course, it's gotta be a D+. One half of one of the best AEW tag teams is up next, Penta El Cerro Miedo. I know nowadays he can get a bit lazy in his matches, but go back to when the Lucha Bros were at their peak, and you'll see, Penta's a hooper. He's always been the perfect complement for Ray Phoenix, kind of serving as the glue that makes that tag team as good as they are. He can fly, but he can throw one hell of a chop, and you know he's always busting out one of those sling blades. 
every time. When it comes to singles though, like I said earlier, he's been getting lazy lately and he's kind of become more of a gesture merchant, but I have no doubt that when he teams back up with Phoenix, he'll be back to his real self in between those ropes. I also have to mention the Lucha Bros feud with the Young Bucks, which is one of the best feuds in AEW history to be honest. It's filled with incredible matches. But back to Penta, I mean, sure he has flaws these days and he might not be all physically there like he was in the beginning, but as a whole, his entire run, it deserves an A-. Peter Avalon has always just been a dark guy in AEW and while he's done some decent things, this video has gone on far too long for me to go into depth about Peter Avalon, so D-. We just talked about his team, so I won't really focus too much on that, but don't fear, there's plenty of singles work to look back on when talking about Ray Phoenix. I made it clear earlier, the Lucha Brothers are great on their own, but it's in singles matches where Phoenix takes a step above Penta. In a wrestling world full of guys who can fly around the ring, Phoenix stands out amongst the crowd as one of the best. While not planned, his biggest accomplishment as a singles wrestler is winning the international title, which, like I said, not planned, but still was a great moment and one that he deserved. But second place in his list of singles accomplishments, and maybe even first for some of you, is his match with Kenny Omega. It's one of many great Kenny Omega title defenses, but Ray Phoenix just looked like one of the guys there. He looked like a true main eventer, and I really hope he gets back to that in this year. As a talent, I genuinely think that Phoenix is one of the best to ever grace AEW, and I think he shows that every time he's in the ring. For him, I'm going in A. The first AEW Women's Champion, Riho, has had a run with AEW that's quietly been really great the whole way through. Obviously, she's a different type of wrestler than almost anyone, being so small, but you never really notice because she structures her matches in a way that perfectly maximizes what that allows her to do in the ring. I also think it's worth mentioning that for all the hate and just disgusting comments she gets online, she has this wholesome connection with the AEW audience that's, you know, unseen anywhere else. Every time she returns, everyone is just so happy to see her, and I always think that's so great. We also have to mention that Riho is a rating straw and pushed Triple H's nose into the dirt during the Wednesday Night Wars. The WWE fear her, AEW fans love her, and Riho is one of the best women's wrestlers they got, honestly. She gets an A-. Next up, we have Sadie Gibbs, who is someone who is in AEW for only a very short time. Pretty much when the pandemic hit, she decided to step away from wrestling and focus on a fitness career, which she's been doing ever since. And I mean, now she's got 350,000 followers on Instagram, so, you know, props to her. But as far as her AEW career goes, it's gotta be an F, of course. Sammy Guevara has had a really tumultuous run in AEW, if I'm being honest. One of the four pillars, there's been plenty of moments where he's flashed the potential to be a top guy, his matches with Cody, tags with the inner circle, and certain moments as TNT Champion being key to that. I say certain moments as TNT Champion very specifically because there were a lot of moments throughout his runs that were pretty fucking awful, especially the American top team. That was the worst of all. But what it really comes down to with Sammy is for him to just stop getting in his own way. There's been so many little moments where he pisses somebody off or does something stupid that he really needs to cut out if he wants to take it to that next level. I honestly still think there's so much potential in him, I'm not saying necessarily as a main eventer, but as someone who can have great matches with main eventers and just be one of those guys right on the cusp of it because, you know, it's what he's best at, having great matches. But he's still young, and if he can get away from Jericho for more than five minutes, he could be a solid hand for them for a very long time. The best I can do for Sammy Guevara is a B. I think at his worst, he's pretty bad, but at his best, I think he's pretty damn good. Scorpio Sky is someone I've talked about on this channel before, especially when it comes to his disastrous TNT Championship reigns. At his best, he was the other half of the first ever AEW Tag Team Champions, but then after that, he tried to move to a singles career and it's just never worked. He probably never should have done it to begin with, honestly. The stuff with American Top Team I just mentioned, his terrible promos, and his middling in-ring work leave a lot to be desired on a roster that was constantly expanding with incredible talent. Even if he was fine in the early days, he's now someone I just don't want anywhere near my TV and probably should be wrapping up with AEW here soon. D. The chair pervert Sean Spears is pretty much remembered for just that in AW, being a chair pervert. That's mostly because it was the only time he was interesting, being the right-hand man to MJF as 
a chair pervert. I do remember him bossing around Wardlow being entertaining TV and, you know, making that Wardlow turn work even better, but the run as a whole was kind of just whatever. I should mention though in case I forgot that he's a chair pervert and also is getting a C- grade. One of the few things I remember about Sonny Kiss and AEW is the match with Kenny Omega that you won't see on Cage Match because it was so short. I also remember Sonny feuding with Joey Janela on Dark, which actually was kind of good if I remember correctly, but you know, it's on Dark. One more thing too, do you remember when she joined the Trustbusters on an episode of Dynamite like the Trustbusters were a big faction and something we should care about? Eh, funny stuff. Funny group, honestly. D-. minus. Stu Grayson is an underrated wrestler who's had a very odd contract history with AEW. First off, the wrestling part. I think he's always shown out when he's gotten the chance, which is something. Remember that match he got with El Phantasmo on Forbidden Door 2023 Zero Hour? I mean, looking back, that's a funny match to have booked on that show, but you know, also looking back, the match was pretty fun. And also you have to mention all the matches the Dark Order had with the Elite that he was involved in. I mean, I remember him balling out in those. Then going back to the odd contract history with AEW, he's a guy who didn't get renewed in 2022, came back a year later, wrestled a few matches on AEW and ROH, and then got released. I don't know why any of that happened, but I think it was worth mentioning just because it's really, it's really weird. But overall for the run, I think it's getting a C-. Trent Beretta, or as he was known then, Trent? With a question mark is one of the more underrated wrestlers of AEW as well. Of course, he has plenty of great matches as a member of the Best Friends, but it's the same kind of dynamic I mentioned when talking about the Lucha Bros and Penta and Rey. He stands above Chucky e. T as a singles wrestler. He's the kind of guy you can always rely on to have a good match with any top name, no matter who you picked, and honestly, I think he's the best at that in AEW. I want to specify, they're good matches. They're not great. But there is value in it nonetheless, and I think now that he's gone fully solo as a heel, we're only going to get to see more and more of it. He's never had those five-star bangers, but even so, he's always been solid as a rock, which is why he's getting the perfect grade to exemplify that, B. Rounding out our list, we have the final name, the magical girl, Yuka Sakazaki. If you stayed this long, you might as well get to hear it too. I I'm, I'm going to say it, it's going to be cringe, but I'm going to do it. Ay -ay -ay. Unfortunately though, Yuka hasn't had very many matches with AEW, which is a problem that they probably should have fixed long ago because she is great. One of those wrestlers with a natural charisma and a natural likability that just hasn't been tapped into like it should be. I think she's injured at the moment, she got injured when she came back actually, and I hope the next time that she gets a chance, that they give her a real chance. So while I do think she's better than the grade I'm going to give, which is true for a lot of people on this list, I can only go off what we have and that's going to give her a C-. But with that, that's going to do it for the video, everyone. Good god, it was a long one. If you've stuck around until the end, thank you so much for watching. I've been recording for nearly two hours, and hopefully you've been watching during work or something so you don't stare into my face for that much time, but I, I mean, hey, if you did, you know, each their own. I, I appreciate it nonetheless. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. We're on the road to 1,000 subscribers, which is a crazy thing to say. I don't know if I was ever going to get to say it, so thank you guys so much for that. Also, leave a like on the video, support all the editing I'm probably going to have to do, and comment down below any grades you agree or disagree with. But also, just to be clear, you can agree. I do want some of you to agree. Say I graded Riho right, say I graded MJF right, or something. I, it's probably going to be scary down there. There's a lot of opinions here, so Give me some help, please. But seriously though, aside from my fear of what the comments might be, thank you all for watching. It's been Novi. Much love to each and every one of you. Peace.